Everybody ready? Ready? Yeah. All right. Listen. It's your weekend show. Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. With Bob Bierman. It's great. Can you believe it's that time of the year again? Oh, we have a very special edition of your weekend show. It's the most wonderful time of the year. With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the half happiest season of all. With those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings when friends come to call. It's the half happiest season of all. Parties for hosting, marshmallows for toasting, and caroling out in the snow. There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. It's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be much mistletoeing, and hearts will be glowing when loved ones are near. It's the most wonderful time of the Scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. It's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be much mistletoeing and hearts will be glowing when loved ones are near. It's the most wonderful time. Yes, the most wonderful time Oh, the most wonderful time Of the year One of those famous Christmas songs from Andy Williams and the most wonderful time of the year. Can you believe that here we are at the beginning of the month of December, the last month of of the year 2019. I I can't believe how fast this year has gone by. From my perspective, it's a a little bit scary how quick this year has gone by. I turned 65 this year, and and I can remember as a youngster, the idea of being 50, let alone 65, it seemed like it was a million years away. And so much has occurred in, in these 65 years. But, but the reality is, and I've noticed this, it seems that the years, well, they go faster as the years go by. We'll talk about that in a little bit. A little bit of housekeeping up front on today's program. Last weekend, I, I shared my heart about the direction that this program may need to take in the months ahead. And I'm getting some response, and I thank you, those that have taken the time to to let me know that you do listen to your weekend show. And it's still very important that I hear from you if I have not heard from you already. Because I'm really debating the best use of this time that I invest each week for the radio show. And because it is a radio show, it has to be confined to a certain length. And it has to be ready by a certain time. And truly, I don't mind doing it if people are responding, as some already have. So I would encourage you, if you've been listening to your weekend show, and in these almost five years now of doing the program, if you've never taken the time to contact the show or the station that airs this show, now, my friend, would be a great time to do it. It would be an encouragement to me and also your thoughts and suggestions for some of the future programs for your weekend show. 
I'm thinking in the back of my mind, by the way, the web, the website for the weekend show is simply this. You go to www.yourweekendshow.com. That is yourweekendshow.com. And you can even send a message by Facebook. I do see those as well. And if you just need the email address, pretty simple. And all the emails come directly to me. And that's simply bob at yourweekendshow.com. And they will come directly to me. And I will even respond to you if you would write sometime soon. As I said, here we are at the beginning of this new month of December. As we prepare in a month to say goodbye to 2019 and what a year it's been politically, economically, and on so many different fronts. And I look forward to the year of 2020. I really do. There's some wonderful opportunity that will probably be taking a little bit of my time, which is why I'm concerned about making good use of the time. My wife and I have been blessed beyond words to have two places that we get to call home. We have a house in Florida that we'll be back at shortly as we get into the winter up here in the mountains. I want to enjoy just a little bit. I've been away from the Four Seasons for a while, and we may spend all the way through Christmas up here at our place in the mountains. It's a lot quieter this time of the year. A lot of our friends and neighbors that live in this area that we call home in Georgia, in Sky Valley, a significant number live in Florida, like we actually do as well. And so it won't be long before we will be at our home in Florida. And when I'm there, I have a lot of work to do both in radio, some radio ministry, and uh, some of the church work that I do that you'll be hearing more about on a couple of the future programs coming up. But for now, what I would like to do for the next several weekends, probably the next four weekends, is to begin to turn our hearts toward this time called Christmas. And I've got several thoughts and topics I'd like to discuss during these times. And I have a couple of people I would love to bring in as guests on the program. I have a friend of mine. He lives in in New Orleans, as he says, New Orleans. And he is the pastor of Good Shepherd Church, and, and he's doing a study right now and a, and a special program for those that deal with dealing with their grief at this time of the year. For many people in the United States in particular, beginning, beginning that last week or so of November and through Christmas can be a very difficult and extraordinarily hard time to get through. I can identify. I can honestly identify. Many of us have lost parents. Maybe we've lost a spouse like I have somewhere along the way. And those first Christmases without them, that first Thanksgiving when they're not across the table, can be incredibly hard. And I would love to bring Randall on the program and, and talk about that. It's something that really is dear to his heart. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of encouraging things that he could share with you and I and on this program as we endeavor to, to help so many people this year will be going through this for the very first time in their lives. And as each passing day gets closer to Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's, Hanukkah, it's going to be difficult for many people. And I know I I was one, and I hope that maybe, maybe next weekend or the weekend after that I can get Randall as a guest on the program and maybe share some thoughts of encouragement. I can tell you that as hard as it was for me, as the years have gone by, 15 of them now, 
it does get easier and there is hope. And and I'm remarried now, and, and God has blessed me with a wonderful wife. She lost her husband about five years ago. And so she can identify as well with what I went through 15 years ago. And so maybe we can share some of that with you in, in a future in a future program during this what is called the Advent season. Now, a lot of people that have been church goers, especially those that may have gone to like a Lutheran church, a Methodist church, a Roman Catholic church, and others that are Episcopal church that are liturgical, have heard the term Advent. Advent is that time that we reflect and think about the first coming of Jesus Christ to Bethlehem. And on these four Sundays and essentially four weeks and a couple of few days, we think about that. It is reflected in our hymns, in the readings at our churches. But, you know, Advent is is no longer really given the attention that it should. Now, I'll tell you that when I was a kid, of course, you know, when you're a little kid, for me, the most important thing that came the day after Thanksgiving, or at least it was for me to look at, was the Sears Wish Book. You remember the Sears Wish Book? I do. I remember it quite well. And I'd look at those Lionel trains and all kinds of toys that I wanted and things to enhance my electronics hobby that was just beginning to blossom as a young child. And I would spend hours looking at that catalog, just just wishing, like the wish book says, right there in the cover, and, and hoping and dropping hints that maybe that's what I would get that year at Christmas time. But you know, there was another aspect of my life that I remember equally as well. It was the preparation for Christmas that came along during that time of Advent. I was raised in in a community in Long Island during my formative years from kindergarten through the eighth grade. Now, while I did live in a town called Manhasset as a very young child, by the time it was time for me to go to school, we moved a little bit farther east on Long Island to a town called Hicksville. Now, Hicksville is a pretty good-sized town now. It has grown immensely since the time that I lived there in all of the late 50s and 1960s. And I remember Hicksville and the school that I attended, which was Trinity Lutheran School. And I was blessed as a kid to have a pretty decent soprano voice for a boy and one that became a decent soprano and alto as a kid growing up. And so I spent a lot of time, a lot of time in the choirs. And so this period of time, beginning in November and into December, we did a little bit of extra rehearsing for all the special music we would have at Christmas for the Christmas Eve service, the Christmas Day service. And so during these, this time that kind of began around Thanksgiving right after, because, you know, if you were raised like I was, we watched the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and back in those days, all the stores were closed, and then everything began early on Friday morning. We call that Black Friday now. It always has been, in a way, considered that, because for many retailers, this is where they begin to actually make a profit for the entire year of operation. They make it during this month of late late November through Christmas. This 30-day period, roughly speaking, is the make-it-or-break-it time for many retail stores. But see, back then, the Christmas stuff didn't show up until after Thanksgiving. Let me kind of remind you of that again. The Christmas stuff in the stores didn't show up until after 
after Thanksgiving was over and done. The first hint of Christmas, if you watch the the Macy's Christmas Day Parade like I did as a kid, was at the very end of this great parade, there's Santa Claus coming into town. That is the beginning of ushering in what we then would know as the Christmas season. And the music on PA speakers inside of department stores and wherever made the switch over to Christmas. But you know, inside of the church that I attended, we didn't exactly switch over to Christmas right away. We dwelt on the four Sundays in Advent. There was no Christmas carols being sung the weekend after Thanksgiving. There were no Christmas decorations inside of the church the weekend after Thanksgiving. There were no Christmas trees inside of the church the weekend after Thanksgiving. Because, see, Advent is that time of preparing for Christmas. Now, of course, yeah, on the secular level, people are shopping, buying gifts, wrapping them up, hiding them, maybe thinking about putting the tree up at some point. You know, I never heard of putting up a Christmas tree the weekend after or before Thanksgiving. Of course, with artificial trees, I guess you can do it. I know as a youngster, we didn't put up our Christmas tree until right before Christmas because it was an actual real tree. And, you know, with heating systems as they are, the air gets dry, the tree dries out, and we had the big, heavy, kind of warm lights on ours as it was back in the day. Are those the, what, the C6 or bigger bulbs that we used to use? And it was like normally four or five, maybe six days before Christmas, before that tree got lugged into our house. And I can remember my my father going up to the attic of our house in Hicksville and bring down box after box after box of, of very delicate ornaments and strings of light that invariably had burnt out light bulbs. And he'd lay all the lights out on the floor carefully and make sure that all the bulbs were tight. Make sure that all the bulbs lit up. And then carefully, after the tree was properly trimmed a little bit more from being put up, make sure that it had the right look, he would carefully begin to to plan and wind those lights around that tree. And at the very end, he would then turn it on, plug it in, and see if any additional bulbs had burnt out since the time that he went through it, making sure that there was no problem with the insulation or anything on the wiring. And then certain very very family-oriented heirloom decorations came out. And my mother and father would carefully and and make sure that they wouldn't just fall off these, these very, these very, well, they had so many memories attached for them, decorations, maybe from their youth and, and their grandparents and whatever the case may be. They would go on the tree next. And then the other glass ornaments and bulbs and what have you were gradually put on there, and we would help. And yes, back in those days, remember this was the 1960s, 1950s, the tinsel went on the tree as well. Then the homemade skirt around the base, it went on too. That was how we put our Christmas tree up the days before Christmas. But there was something that was already out, already out, and it was often on the dining room table, and sometimes it would get moved to a coffee table if we had friends or family over for for some event at, at the home. It was called an Advent wreath. 
And my mother would put this together with garland, and she had a total of five candles. And for years, later on, we changed it a little bit, but for years it was four purple candles and one big red, uh, one, one big white candle in the center. These four candles around the white candle. And beginning on the first Sunday in Advent, at dinner time, we would light one candle to mark this first Sunday in Advent. Our church also had an Advent wreath. And on the second Sunday, you lit the first and the second candle. The third Sunday, you did the third candle and so on. And by the fourth Sunday, all four candles are lit. And on Christmas Eve, going into Christmas Day, you lit the Christ candle, the center candle, that we've made it through this period of time in preparation to meet the Savior. And the whole idea of Advent, the whole idea of taking this time for Advent was to remind ourselves of what it was like over 2,000 years ago as God's chosen people had been promised a Messiah, and they waited and waited and waited in anticipation of his arrival. For them to have redemption, for them to be to be bought back into the family, so to speak, to have a way. We'll talk about that as we continue on our program today, but one of the most haunting hymns that we would sing on that first, that very first Sunday in Advent was, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, who longs in lowly exile here, until the Son of God appears. Rejoice! Rejoice, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That hymn, even from my youngest years as a child, and singing the descant that often is accompanied in a choral version of that particular hymn, still resonates in this 65-year-old man's heart to this very day. Oh,
even after almost six decades that I have heard that particular hymn, its haunting melody still still stirs me and makes me think that hymn and its plea still after over 60 years from the earliest memories of my childhood I remember that particular hymn and for me it is just as much a part of this time of the year of any Christmas carol, Christmas song, decoration, famous movie, without without that particular hymn, it's just not it's just not the same. Because see for me, and and this is what I've learned and developed and has become so much a part of my life over these many decades. Christmas is not just a winter solstice holiday when people get together, exchange gifts, have parties, drink a lot, and take time off from their regular work and labor in school. While Christmas has a lot of celebration aspects to it, I'm sure many of you listening that are still working on a regular basis, there'll be some parties where you work, I'm sure. You'll see some friends and family during this time, I'm sure, if if you can. But to me, without an Advent, there cannot be a Christmas. Because, see, from my point of view... Without an advent, without a promise, what is Christmas anyway? I'll talk about this a few times and remind you between now and the fourth Sunday in Advent when we take the time to remember Advent and look into Christmas. And I will share with you some of my most deepest thoughts on that program as we get toward the the end of the month, the, the second to the last weekend of the month, to be exact, as we will do our Christmas special for your weekend show. And I hope that you will find it. I hope you listen to every program between now and then to prepare for it. Because, see... For me, Christmas becomes nothing more than an empty secular holiday if the promise of Christ and his salvation are not a part of it. You know, I remember one of the most exciting things, but at the same time, one of the most sad things in my years of being a full-time church pastor was always the Christmas Eve service. For a number of years, when I was a pastor of a nicely growing church, Christmas Eve was special to a lot of our members. It was our one of our big deal services, for lack of a better way to describe it. This is where we pulled out all the stops. We had the best music. We had the candles. We had the atmosphere. It was late and on a Christmas Eve. It was 11 o'clock at night. And this was a highly attended service. I can remember putting out what are what's called luminary into the parking lot and driveway coming into the church. That's, you know, bags filled with sand and a candle to light the way to the parking lot so we could use as much non-artificial lighting as possible. And the bell carillon that we had installed would be playing so many of the popular and well-known Christmas carols for about 20 minutes before the beginning of the service as people arrived. 
And as the mighty organ, we had a pipe organ, you know, opened up with with our opening hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful, and the procession began. I presided over probably the most attended service in the entire year at that church, only rivaled occasionally by Easter. And there on that Christmas Eve, you would have all of the regular members, a lot of the people that for some other, for some unknown reason seem to have a hard time making it out on, on many a Sunday morning, but they, they seem to find their way out there on Christmas Eve. Many of the people in our church that were older, because this is Florida, a lot of their kids and grandkids sometimes were were in town to see grandma and grandpa instead of them heading north. And you'd have these large families, extended families attending on that Christmas Eve night. I have some of the most vivid memories of young children under the age of five, some falling asleep, some probably daydreaming about what's going to happen tomorrow, what gifts are under the tree. But for that night, for that evening, for that time before they went home to to go to bed, I could share with them like I'm sharing with you the reason and the meaning and the power of this particular season. Now, I know here in the United States, the Hallmark Channel or others have been doing the Christmas stuff since, what, the end of September? And I've seen in places like the Walmarts and and the Lowe's and and the Home Depots and what have you, the, the whole Christmas display settings have been out since before Halloween, in some cases. And you know that I'm telling the truth on that. You've seen them. I think the funniest thing to me is to go into the local Home Depot up here in Georgia. And there they have all these Halloween decorations and all these mechanical howling skeleton coyote dogs. And you've seen them. They make those howling sounds. And all these decorations for Halloween and it's all sitting next to the Thanksgiving turkey uh, decorations which are part of the increasingly growing Christmas decoration and the first Christmas trees and normally I finally figured it out a lot of the Christmas trees they're selling early on in the season are the ones that they've been stuck with since last year and they, they try to get those out in October. And then by now, as you're getting before, as you got before Thanksgiving and into the first week of December, now all the new and full price stuff is out as people prepare. I think we've forgotten how to prepare for Christmas. I know and I understand more than you ever will even begin to know and I get this I really do I thoroughly understand that that many parents today they they both work it's not it's not cheap to live in this world today our expectations are higher our wants are greater I'm not sure if it's so much our need as it is sometimes our greed But trying to just get through day-to-day life, along with Christmas, can be an incredibly exhausting task for a lot of young families today. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I see it all the time. It can also be a very stressful time of the year. I've got a brother who lives up in Virginia. I saw him about, oh, not quite a month ago. And he and I were kind of talking about how we deal with Christmas and 
And, and I got to give my brother David some credit. You have to know my brother David to appreciate him. His idea of shopping is just go online. And he's been doing that online since before it was fashionable. He doesn't like to be in crowded stores, and I and who can blame him? But he often says he feels the obligation that he has to get people something. We've driven that into our culture so much that in the Western culture, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Europe, Yep, we got to go out and buy something for somebody. And trust me, those in marketing and retail will fill your inbox for your email and your mailbox for regular snail mail with every enticement under the sun for you to buy their stuff for this upcoming holiday season holiday events, holiday meals, holiday travel. You name it, they're ready to sell it. Unfortunately, from my perspective, with all the stress of the holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's season, right after Thanksgiving, that is now behind us, We lose sight of Christmas itself. For many youngsters in in public schools, this is the winter holiday. God forbid we offend anybody by even acknowledging that the word Christmas fits in there somewhere. Have to totally ignore that. You know, I can remember when I was in high school in upstate New York, back in the late 60s, and we we did a a Christmas program a week or so before Christmas, and we sang, oh, we actually sang Christmas carols. We didn't just sing about Frosty the Snowman and and it's the most wonderful time of the year. No, we, we sang about Christmas. We would sing Silent Night. We would sing, O come all ye faithful, and this was in a public school. Now, I know that may be offensive to some of you listening, and, and, and it's sad that it is offensive to you. I know our world is more pluralistic than it used to be. But I think one of the worst things that ever happened is the secularization of America. Now, I'm going to say this and preface it by saying, has America always been a moral, great, and Christian nation? Of course not. And anybody that that thinks that it was some wonderful, God-fearing, church-going, Bible-holding, believing nation from the top down is only deceiving themselves. Let's just say that right up front. I mean, look at our own history going back to the days of the Revolutionary War and the time after we as a nation won our freedom. Was everybody some kind of a super Sunday Christian? Nope. Not at all. But there were several differences. Difference number one. Though there was no particular state denomination or church, the state acknowledged and had the utmost respect for people of faith and also of an almighty God. There's no doubt about that. Presidents over the years wrote and led to the nation in prayer. I can think of one time in World War II where the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, at the time that D-Day had begun, got on the radio and led the entire nation in prayer for those soldiers that were landing and storming the beaches of Normandy. 
Because even as we began that war, we did not know if we were going to win. I mean, let's go back to 1944 for, for just a moment here. Take a little side trip with me, if you would. You know, my my wife's father was one of the soldiers that landed and survived D-Day. In 1944, my father served in the United States Marines and was fighting almost a forgotten war behind the lines in China. We hear about the island hopping, but you sometimes forget about the literally guerrilla warfare going on in China to push the Japanese to the sea. Because, see, the Japanese were trying to take all of the Pacific Islands and the resources of China and even Korea. That was their goal. And so there we we had soldiers spread out all over. And my father's particular job was to be in a detachment that worked behind enemy lines in Japan. And so as you would have headed toward Christmas of 1944, while things are beginning to look up in Europe, while things are beginning to look a little bit better in the Pacific, we knew potentially the worst was yet to come, especially in the Pacific, because we had not yet yet landed and tried to take the, the island of Japan, which would have cost us millions of lives of our young people to fight that war. We didn't know if we could penetrate or what the depth we would find and fighting in Europe. And it took, it took almost a year from the time of D-Day until the war ended in Europe. But there were times in 1944, had D-Day failed, and had we been pushed off the shores of Normandy and France, Had we not succeeded, and if you study a little bit of history, you'll find out that that because of a few blunders and mistakes was the only reason that we really succeeded. There could have been additional forces sent to repel us, but because the leader of Germany was asleep and did not want to be awakened, those reinforcements never came. A lot of interesting history. So if you would for just a moment, let's go back to this time of the year in 1944. Christmas 1943 and 1942, we didn't have a whole lot of good news from either the European or the Pacific Theater in World War II. And a lot of people would wonder, would we still be a free nation, unconquered, by the time we would get to to next Christmas? Would we, would we make it another year? And so here we are. Here we are at Christmas 1944. And I can only imagine in my mind trying to smile trying to act jolly during that period of time and how many families at Christmas 1944 had the heartbreak of knowing that one of their sons had died in Europe or out in the Pacific in the year or two before how hard that Christmas must have been for them. But you know, Christmas as we prepare for it, 
And let's not lose sight of Advent. This is what I'm trying to tell you today. Christmas is a time of hope. And on this broadcast and next week and the week after, I want to spend some time talking about hope. Now, once again, I want to remind you this is your weekend show. And I'm your host, Bob Bierman. If you haven't uh, responded before, and I asked you last week if you'd just take the time, as I plan the future of this program, I, there may be some changes in the way the program is done, and I would like your input. I've got some great responsibility to take on early in 2020 in a lot of my church work. That's going to take a lot of my time. And I'll be speaking more about that as we get into January and February, some of the things that I'm up to in that regard, some other projects that are in the background. They're important things that need to be done. Would you go to the website, yourweekendshow.com? Maybe visit us on Facebook at Your Weekend Show. Once again, this weekend we are preparing our hearts and minds as we head toward that day called Christmas. But as we do that, Let us not lose sight of this very special season of Advent. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Come thou long expect. Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength in consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire
and online at yourweekendshow.com with Bob Bierman. This particular hymn that goes back so many years, written by John Wesley, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's another one of those hymns that are a part of my memories in my youth in preparing for this time of the year. For me anyway, Christmas is not just some kind of a secular holiday for kids. I, I, my heart breaks every time I hear parents talk about, well, Christmas is for children. It's all about Santa Claus. It's all about gifts. And I have seen, I have seen in my lifetime, too many children that get up on a Christmas morning and rip through those gifts in a matter of minutes. I have seen children. I have seen children defiant, unhappy with the gifts that they got, demanding that they be replaced. That has nothing to do with the Christmas we are preparing to have. It's where the world has co-opted something beautiful and made it something ugly. To me, Christmas the way it is often celebrated today is ugly. It is full of stress, full of opulence, full of too much over the top. And the expectations are all about the things that we get, the stuff that we get. And, and yeah, we, we deal with that little babe in, in the manger in Bethlehem, maybe. Because, you know, we got to go to grandma and grandpa's house. And, and they're one of the few remaining members of the family that, that even go to a church on Christmas. Let alone Easter. It is a sad state of affairs that we have taken this wonderful, meaningful, and most powerful holiday, remembering something that changed the course of human history and have reduced it down to nothing but feel-good Hallmark movies. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against a, a, a good movie. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. But that's not the primary reason for this season. Going to Walmart, shopping online at Amazon, that is not the purpose of Christmas. That is not the purpose of this time called Advent. Preparing for Christmas is not planning dinners, putting up decorations, and shopping. It's about remembering the need that we have as human beings for a Savior. And that God spared not his own beloved Son, but sent him to live and dwell among us, to know all the things that are before us, and to die in our place for the sins that have been laid upon us by our own doing. That, my friend, is the beginning of what Christmas is all about. We are content in the world to talk about a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. But we do not want to recognize that that young child grew up to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's what this season of Advent is all about. This is your weekend show, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman. Savior of the nations, come show yourself the virgin son. Marvel heaven, wonder. Spirit 
it up for this week. Don't forget the website yourweekendshow.com yourweekendshow.com Until next week, may God richly bless you.